For 200 years, the global economy has followed one simple, unbreakable rule. People work. People earn. People buy. It's the engine of capitalism. You trade your labour for a wage, and then you trade that wage for the stuff someone else produced. But we are now building an intelligence that breaks this loop. What happens when AI does all the work, but people don't earn anything anymore? Because here's the uncomfortable question that no tech CEO wants to answer on stage. If humans stop being economically useful, who exactly is left to buy the world's products? This isn't science fiction, it's a math problem, and the equation is starting to solve for zero. In this video, we aren't predicting the future. We are dissecting a structural flaw that is already forming. We're going to break down why AI is pushing the cost of human labor towards zero and why Goldman Sachs says 300 million jobs are on the line. Second, why capitalism depends on consumers way more than it depends on workers. And finally, the three unstable futures we might be heading toward and why an economy that removes humans from production might accidentally remove demand itself. By the end, you'll understand why the most dangerous thing about AI isn't that it takes your job, it's that it might break the market you live in. Chapter 1 The Consumer Economy Problem To understand the crash, you have to understand the engine. We like to think that economies are built on production, factories, farms and code bases. But that's wrong. Modern economies are built on consumption. If you look at the United States, roughly 68% of the entire GDP comes from one thing, consumer spending. That means the entire machine, the stock market, the tech giants, the logistics networks, is held up by regular people buying groceries, paying rent and upgrading their iPhones. And where does the money for that spending come from? For the vast majority of the population, it comes from wages. It comes from trading hours for dollars. Historically, technology has always been a force multiplier for this dynamic. When we invented the tractor, 90% of farmers lost their jobs, but they moved to factories. When we invented the spreadsheet, computers replaced calculators, but accountants got faster. But MIT economist Darren Asimoglu warns that we are now entering an era of what he calls so-so automation. This is technology that replaces human labor just enough to cut costs, but doesn't necessarily create new higher value jobs to replace them. The difference this time is the scope. We aren't just automating physical muscles, we are automating the cognitive lever. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, recently released a report stating that 40% of global employment is exposed to AI. In advanced economies, that number jumps to 60%. Think about that. If you remove wages from 40% of the population, you don't just have an unemployment crisis, you have a revenue crisis. Because an economy can survive if it can't produce enough goods. But it collapses instantly if no one can afford to consume them. Now, before you go to the comments and type, technology always creates more jobs than it destroys. Let me introduce you to the most terrifying chart in economic history. It's called Leontief's Paradox. In 1915, there were 26 million horses in the United States. They were the engine of the economy. They hauled freight, plowed fields and fought wars. If you asked an economist back then about the future, they would have said, sure, tractors are coming, but horses will just get better jobs. They'll move from farming to supervising the tractors. That didn't happen. Within 50 years, the horse population collapsed by 85%. Why? Because the internal combustion engine didn't just replace their muscle, it replaced their comparative advantage. Once a tractor could pull more, eat less and work 24-7, there was zero economic reason to employ a horse. This is the intelligence trap. For the last century, humans survived automation because we retreated to the one thing machines couldn't do, cognition. We moved from muscle jobs to brain jobs. But AI is the first technology in history that attacks our final comparative advantage. When a model can code, write, plan, and analyze faster than you, you are not the farmer in this analogy. You are the horse. And horses don't get upskilled. They get put out to pasture. Chapter 2. The Broken Loop There is an old story, maybe apocryphal but accurate, about Henry Ford II showing the union leader Walter Ruther around a newly automated factory floor. Ford points to the robots and says, Walter, how are you going to get those robots to pay your union dues? And Ruther replies, Henry, how are you going to get them to buy your cars? That is the paradox. In the old world, a worker was a dual entity. To the boss, they were a cost, someone to be paid. But to the market, they were a customer, someone who spends. These two roles balanced each other out. The money paid out in wages eventually flowed back into corporate profits. But AI breaks the duality. 
An AI agent, let's say a fully autonomous coder or a customer service bot, is the perfect worker. It works 24-7. It never complains. It costs pennies on the dollar but it is a terrible customer. It doesn't buy houses, it doesn't pay taxes, it doesn't subscribe to Netflix, it doesn't buy new shoes. Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, has openly admitted this. In his essay, Moore's Law for Everything, he predicts that as AI advances, the price of many kinds of labor will fall towards zero. If the price of labor falls to zero, the cost of goods might drop, sure. But if your income also falls to zero, it doesn't matter if a loaf of bread costs a penny, you still can't buy it. This is the deflationary trap. AI produces infinite supply, but simultaneously destroys the demand required to soak it up. At scale, this doesn't optimize capitalism, it cannibalizes it. Chapter 3. The Wealth Concentration Trap So if humans stop earning wages, who actually keeps the money? The answer is simple, ownership. In economics, there is always a battle between labor and capital. For the last 50 years, the share of income going to labor has been slowly dropping. But in the AI era, capital becomes the only game in town. If you own the AI model, the compute, the energy source, or the data center, you capture 100% of the value created by that productivity. You no longer have to share a cut with the worker, because there is no worker. Wealth doesn't trickle down, it vacuums up. Mustafa Suleiman, the co-founder of DeepMind, warns in his book, The Coming Wave, that this centralization of power represents a step change in human capability that could leave the vast majority of people outside the economic walls. We see these comments all the time. The markets need buyers, or rich people need someone to sell to. And that's true. But there is a terrifying interim period where the elite economy creates value for itself. B2B AI services selling to other B2B AI services. Algorithms trading stocks with other algorithms. The economy doesn't become inefficient it becomes irrelevant to the biological humans watching from the sidelines. And this leads to a scenario that sounds like a glitch in the matrix, but is already happening. Economists call it the M2M economy, machine-to-machine -machine commerce. Right now, we assume the economy needs humans to buy things to keep growing. But what if it doesn't? We are already seeing the rise of a ghost economy, where machines trade entirely with other machines. High-frequency trading algorithms buying stocks from other algorithms. AI marketing agents bidding on ad space sold by other AI agents. Data centers selling compute to other data centers. By 2030, the machine-to-machine -machine market is projected to hit nearly $94 billion. We could legitimately see a future where the GDP skyrockets, the stock market hits all-time highs, and corporate profits explode. While the human unemployment rate sits at 50%, the economy doesn't die, it just decouples it becomes a closed loop of digital value circulation that bypasses biological life entirely. The factory keeps running, the lights stay on, the numbers go up. We just aren't invited to the meeting anymore. The real question and the way out. So the real question isn't, will AI take my job? The real question is, how do I remain relevant in a world that is rewriting the rules of value? Because while the macro economy figures out its identity crisis, you still have a career to navigate. And this brings us to the most urgent shift you need to make right now. You have to move from being an executor, someone who does the work, to an orchestrator, someone who directs the intelligence. If you don't know how to make that pivot, I've got you covered. I've put together the AI Career Survival Guide. This isn't some generic ebook. It is a tactical blueprint designed for this specific 2025 to 2028 window. It helps you run a replaceability audit on your current role to see exactly which parts of your job are in the danger zone. And more importantly, it helps you find your asymmetric edge, the one specific human skill you have that AI cannot replicate. The link is right there in the description and the pinned comment. Don't wait until the next model drops. Download it, audit yourself, and build your moat. Chapter four, the three unstable futures. Now let's zoom back out, because the economy cannot stay broken forever, something has to give. Economists and futurists generally agree there are only three ways this plays out. Path one, digital feudalism. This is the default path if we do nothing. A world where a tiny class of AI owners, the techno lords, rent out intelligence to everyone else. You don't have a job, you have a subscription. You live on a stipend or gig work servicing the few things robots can't do yet. 
It's stable for the owners, but dystopian for everyone else. Path two, state redistribution. This is what Sam Altman calls Moore's law for everything. The idea is that because AI creates so much wealth so cheaply, the government taxes the land and the computing and redistributes it as UBI, universal basic income. Altman argues that if we get this right, we can improve the standard of living for people more than we ever have before. But this relies on politics functioning perfectly. And when has that ever happened? Path three, the post-labor reboot. This is the wild card, a world where we fundamentally redefine value away from labor entirely. Where the economy isn't about earning a living, but about allocating abundance. It sounds utopian, but it requires a rewrite of the human social contract that usually only happens after a war or a collapse. None of these paths are guaranteed and none of them are painless. But the one option we don't have is going back to the way things were. The open loop. For 200 years, capitalism assumed one foundational truth, that human friction was necessary, that we were the bottleneck to production. AI removes the bottleneck, but in doing so, it reveals what the economy was always built on, human scarcity. When intelligence becomes abundant and labor becomes infinite, money stops answering the most important question of all, who matters? The real crisis coming toward us isn't job loss, it's demand without dignity. So, in a world where work disappears, what gives people economic relevance? That question doesn't belong to the future. It's already here. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.